Actually, would you allow me to offer a word of prayer before we begin? Father, we praise you. We honor you for who you are. We want to thank you for the privilege to walk into your house. To be reminded once again, we have a living God. We have a loving God. We have a redeeming God. And we have a God that does not want to leave any of his sheep outside of the fold. And so, Father, may our worship, may the word be anointed and blessed by your Holy Spirit. I humbly ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, in many circles, when we are engaged in presenting Christ, whether be it in the secular sector in America, what we call the postmodernists, whether we are dealing with huge sector of the world that does not come from Christian background, so many times we are engaged in explaining whether through proofs, whether through evidence of, of how God can become man. How can God uh, leave the sphere of the eternity, of the infinite, and to walk into the finite human history. And so, in many cases, I realize that the more we want to explain how, I think we need to focus on the fact why. For me, it became very, very important to, to first experience it for myself, and then trying to convey this to the, to the communities that don't come from Christian background, and I wanted to know if I can bring this as a message both to us as Christians, as believers in Christ, and to empower us in this new coming new year to see the why of Christmas and how does this affect me? Why should I go through this ritual, this tradition every year? Next slide. Uh, I'm pretty sure many of you... Next slide, por favor. Thank you. Uh, in many cases, I'm pretty sure many of you have to deal with, with this huge, massive Christmas onslaught, you know, this ordeal with Christmas. And so many people, uh, I have a neighbor, the day after Christmas, he threw out the whole tree, everything with it, even the lights still on the tree. And I'm like, this is a love-hate relationship, you know, you couldn't wait to get rid of this whole thing. But in many cases, I'm noticing that uh, many of us go through this ordeal. You know, it's happy, it's joyous, it's, it's fun. But what do you do now it's over? Christmas is over. Now what? Now what do we do? Uh, and then we look forward to the new year. I have a question. My brother, Matt, uh, do we have a challenge in changing the slide? Thank you. Uh, and, and in many cases, I've noticed that uh, we really would like to experience the joy of it. Many of us don't. Many of us would go through the motion of, of Christmas and the season, yet many of us are, are hurting. Many of us are, are bearing some scars from the year that went by. And, and so we, we just go through whatever is expected of us, and we make it through another tradition just to look forward to it the next year we'll keep doing this you know here's what I've noticed for a Christian for a believer in Christ Christmas never ends Christmas never ends okay and I want to dwell on the first section a little bit on this fact before I, I, I concluded with the with the core of the message so next slide please um, I have been preoccupied as a believer in Christ, as someone who believes that he was bought and redeemed by the blood of Christ. What I want to occupy my mind, and maybe you can engage me with this, why would God bother with this? Why did he do this incredible work that took so much risk, so much danger, it involved bloodshed, an incredible amount of bloodshed in Bethlehem and the five surrounding towns when Herod the Great 
found out that he is not being visited by the Magi's, that he has been basically outwitted by the Magi's, he gave orders to kill, to massacre, who knows how many thousands of children. And all this, you know, it, it brings a, a, an ever insisting, ever persisting question. The why of Christmas to me is more important and I want to share this with you to see if you can see if you can delve into this. The why of Christmas is a bit more important for the church, for the Christian community to be able to convey to the world around us or else or else we have just gone through another ritual and we pull out all the carol, caroling books, we pull out all the robes and all the decorations and as soon as it's done we throw the whole thing or pack it up in the in the warehouses let's move on we don't even want to sing christmas songs during the year one pastor told me oh brother man these people are going to laugh at us why why would they laugh at us if we truly delve into the message of christmas you see the the consumerist or the, I should say the merchandising world, doesn't think so. They don't think Christmas begins and ends in December 25. Man, all the good and all the banners and all the stuff that they become advertised from July. Right? I mean, they start throwing it at you. Get ready, Christmas is coming around the corner, six months, but it's around the corner, it's a blink of an eye. So if the secular merchandising money-making machine reminds you that Christmas actually never ends, why does the church close the book on Christmas? Why do we just go through the Advent season at one point in time, and then once we're done with it, just like my neighbor threw out the, you know, the tree with the lights, I'm glad it's done and over with. Next slide. Why Christmas? Next slide. When Christ was promised to his parents, to his earthly parents. The angel said, Emmanuel will be his name. Prophet Isaiah, seven centuries before Jesus said, he will be born of a virgin, but he will be called Emmanuel. The word Emmanuel in Aramaic has two simultaneous functions. When you say, Awan Imanu Idlin, when you say, He is with us, the word also means He is one of us. So, Imanu El means not only God came to be with us, but He wanted to be one of us. Next slide. You know, it was so incredible. When you look at the life of Jesus, both in the context of Christianity and also in the Abrahamic traditions in the East, you realize one thing. Everybody flocked to him. The children loved to come around him. The children loved to hear his stories. The rich came to him. The poor came to him. The healthy came to him. The sick came to him. He just gravitated people. Why? Because he was God with us. You see, look at all the worlds around you, all the traditions around you, and even paganism around you. Even in the hardcore paganism of then and now, they know. For instance, I'll give you some case in point. In the deep concept of Hinduism, there is an, a, a belief that is called moksha, which means the ultimate, the ultimate transformation. And when you talk to a Hindu, they say, well, he is the ultimate God. But we don't know where, we don't know how, we don't know when. When you look at the Buddhists, same ultimate nirvana. When you look at some of the pagan worlds of then, you would always realize that there was this redemptive footprint of God all over the place. In the Syrophoenicians, in the Canaanites, people know that there is a God, but in many cases don't know how to find him. The Bible says he has put eternity in their hearts. That means what he has put in them is a mechanism that draws them to the supreme creator. Everybody does it their way. This is why the Bible says in the fulfillment of time, in the fullness of time, 
the Son of God, was manifested to the world. And when he was manifested, they gravitated towards him. Jewish leaders, in secret, many of them believed in him. Children loved him. The sick said, I can only just touch his, his hem of the garment. I don't even want to touch him. Just the hem of his garment and I will be healed. And they were healed. Why? Because God came to be with us. And not only with us, one of us. Next slide, please. Uh, an incredible passage. Can you read it on the screen? Okay. An incredible passage that I think helps us in expanding this incredible work of Emmanuel. Notice what the book of Hebrews says in chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets and many times and in various ways. But in these last days, and it's so interesting that from the day that Christ stepped into human history, the Bible says last days begin. And notice what he says. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Every time you use the word but, it makes a sharp turn. I love you, baby, but <laughs> something has to give. Something has to be addressed, right? In this case, the Bible tells us he spoke in various ways. Through multitude of prophets, through cracking the Red Sea, pouring down manna. Raining fire, world flood, all through the whole thing. He, the Bible says he spoke in various ways, but in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son. That means that is the ultimate way that God will speak to us. Now notice what he says also. Whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also made the universe. Well, here's a question. The first time God's name is mentioned in the Bible, the word Elohim, immediately after the work of creation is accomplished, the Bible uses the word Jehovah Elohim, which in English we translate Lord God. All right? In the third chapter of the book of Genesis, when Adam and Eve decided to take matters in their own hands and disobeyed God, the Bible says, as soon as they heard Jehovah Elohim walking in the garden, they hid themselves. You all remember the story, right? Okay. Later on, centuries later, John tells us, no one has seen God except the Son. So I have a question for you. The Bible says, Adam and Eve in their fallen estate until that day, and we don't know for how long after that, they were visited by Jehovah Elohim, Lord God, at the cool of every day. And yet the Bible says no one has seen God. No one includes Adam and Eve. So I have a question for you. Who do they see when Jehovah Elohim is walking in the cool of the day in the garden? Book of Hebrews says, the one who created all. And the Bible says, the one who created all walked in the garden, and his name was Jehovah Elohim. Hebrews says, now through his son he talks to us, through whom he made all things. So who is Jehovah Elohim? It is Jesus, and he's walking in the garden. And I believe that he wanted to walk again the dusty roads of Jerusalem with his own people. And it's so fascinating that if you just think of this, not only he didn't abandon us, not only he didn't distance himself, he said, now I'm going to be one of them. I am not ashamed of them. I don't care what they have done to me. I don't care what they will do to me. I don't care what I have to go through I don't want to just appear to them as many of our Jewish brothers and sisters believe the Mashiach will do. Oh, he's just going to appear in Jerusalem. Many rabbis are telling the Jewish people today. But this Yehovah Elohim said, not only I want to go with them, I want to become one of them. 
And the fact that I want to become one of them, I can only do it through my son. And so the Bible tells us the very person that created all, no one has seen him, that very person is the son, and the son is the very one who came to live among us. Next slide, please. So the first why that I think really will help us understand why Christ came to this world is summed up in this. Join the human race once and for all. Jesus said, who has seen me, he has seen the Father. Next slide. Here's the next why. The thief comes not, the Lord said, for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have what? And what kind of a life? And that you might have a more what? The word perisos in Greek means more above beyond anything. The, the word that really knocked me out of the definition, vehement. I came to this world because I want you to have a vehement life. A life that is not just surviving. That's the lie of the evolution. Oh, well, you just survive. How are you doing, brother? Oh, just surviving. No, the Lord did not come to this world so that you and I can survive under the onslaught of the enemy, but that you and I could thrive. Why? Because that is the reason he came to this earth. Would you think the 2020 would be the day, the year that you decide, I don't want to survive anymore, I want to thrive. I don't want to just make it through, I want to have a vehement, abundant life. But the life that he came to give me. The next point. Next slide, please. <clears throat> but when people keep on sinning, the Lord says, through John, it shows that they belong to the devil, who has been sinning since the beginning. But the Son of God, everybody say, but the Son of God, but came to destroy the works of this is another reason why our Lord came to this earth. To give us the abundant life, he had first to destroy the works of the devil. Has he been destroying the works of the devil in your life? Or are we still claiming hallelujahs, but Monday comes along, we get battered and bruised until Sabbath comes around? Are you still shackled to hate, to bitterness, to fear, to anger, to rage, to pornography online, to addictions, secret addictions, open addiction, road rage? He came to destroy the works of the devil. Not to do it once but to do it as long as he lives. Next slide, please. The second reason why I think he came to this earth is to give you hope, but not from a distance, not only to be with you, but to be in you. Mahatma Gandhi has many famous quotes about Jesus. He said, Christianity is the only religion that I know that the leader and the founder can live in the followers. This is Mahatma Gandhi. Not only he wants to be with me, not only he wants to walk with me, but he wants to be in me. Little Amanda, not her real name, uh, her dad was a preacher in church. That morning, Daddy had preached in church about how big, how vast, how huge God is. And so they're back home. She's about four years old. True story, four years old. And Mommy is helping her change from church clothes to home clothes. And as she's changing, she says, Mommy, yeah, baby, is God very big? 
Yeah, baby, he's very big. Mommy, yeah, baby. Is, is he bigger than daddy? Yeah, baby, he's bigger than daddy. A few minutes later, mommy, yes, baby. Is he bigger than our house? Mommy says, yeah, baby, God is bigger than our house. Mommy, is he bigger than the sky? And mommy says, I'm wondering where is this four-year-old going with this? She says, yeah, baby, he's bigger than the sky. Why are you asking? Amanda says, well, daddy said in church that God is very big. Mm -hmm. And that he says he lives in us. Mm -hmm. She says, if he's so big and if he lives in us, wouldn't it show? In your face theology from a four-year-old. <laughs> if God is so big and he lives in you. No, let me, let me rephrase it. God is so big and he lives in you. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't it show? Wouldn't it show? Next slide. This is how God loved. Not only he went, came to be with us, one of us, to be in us. In a conversation that is one of the most mysterious conversations in the entire New Testament, a religious leader, a highly religious leader, Nicodemus, which basically in Greek means the Lord of the people. He came in secret to speak with Jesus. He had a burden. He had a heavy heart. He knew there is something about Jesus, but he couldn't express it to his ranks because he would be left out, he would be put out, he would be ostracized. So he comes in the cover of the night, he comes to Jesus, and he says, Rabbi, we know, many of us know you came from God, or else no one can do the things you are doing. We know you came from God. Jesus stops the man, and he tells him, God loves you. So much in such a way that he gave his only one. Monogenes, the word means there's only one of him. Nicodemus came for another reason. He came for some kind of a verification. He came for validation. He came to see, are you the one? Are you not the one? And the one doesn't care whether you call him Lord or not, doesn't care whether he's accepted by his people, he doesn't care whether he's accepted and received as the Messiah. All he cared about is to tell this religious leader who was so sincere and came to him, God loves you so much that he gave the one that there's only one of. The intense love is why he came to this earth. Next slide, please. And not only he wants to be with us, not only he wants to be in us, not because he only did that, not because he loves us so much, but he wants this. He wants to come in into a life so that life can also be the means that some other life can be affected. You see, in many cases we think salvation is just something you grab and run with it. No, 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 that salvation needs to be ministered. That salvation needs to be distributed. Or else Christmas will become just another ritual. Not only he wants to do this for you, not only he wants to walk with you, be with you, be in you, But through you, he wants to infill another desperate, cracked vessel. And so, it will be him doing the witnessing. So I have a question for you. If you accept the fact that the scripture tells us the truth, if you accept that God came to be with us, If you accept that God came to be one of us, if you accept the word that says Christ in you brings you the hope of glory, 
Do you think God can work through you? If a little Amanda is correct, if he is in us, is he capable of doing the work through you? But he's such a gentleman, he always knocks. He never says, you serve me or else. God always asks permission, invites me. Would you let me do this work? What's your name? Samuel. Samuel. If God lives in you, I don't know what that means to the human mind because I don't have the mind to understand it. But if God lives in you and he still asks you permission, can I reach out to the person, I won't go this side, but to the person next to you who makes your life miserable? Do you think I can work through you to reach that individual? Samuel says, I'm busy. I got work to do. I got school. I got bills to pay. I got children to raise. I have payments to make. I don't have time. And the God who is in you says, if not now, when? This is a question that in my humble opinion, many of us forget to ask during the Christmas season. If he is in me, if he came to bring this to me, to do this for me, why am I keeping him to myself? It would be a privilege to let him work through me. See, this awareness is what is so essential for us when we go through this, at least this season. And I'm not talking about, what was, was it in winter? Was it not in winter? I'm not going to go talk to that. I'll leave that to, to the people who thrive on that. All I want is this. If Christ came to be with me, if according to the Bible, he is in me, explain to me, I beg of you, why are there 3.5 billion that are still not reached by the gospel? Tell me, first century, I was listening to a, 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 a symposium of a very known historian and archaeologist, Dr. Fred Doner. He says, we have evidence that before the first century was out, the gospel had reached all the way to Nepal, mountains of Everest. Then how is it? With every conceivable technology at our fingertips, Twitter, smartphones, not so smartphones, I got whole host of things in my pocket. You have more technology in your pocket than the whole Apollo missions for seven missions to the moon. And yet we have over 3.5 billion that are still not reached. Why should Christianity go be shriveling in America? Why? Because Christians, in my humble opinion, have forgotten that God lives in them. And if he lives in them, do I have a mean to go around sorrowful? Do I have any reason to go around undecisive? Would it be a burden? Does your pastor have to nag and drag you to do witnessing for your community? It will be an honor to commune. It will be an honor to go out and tell about him. Why? Because just the thought of it, just the logical thought of it blows the mind. How can the one who spoke and this eternal universe comes into existence? Light came about. Time and space came about. That creator says, I want to live in you. If he lives in me, can he do the incredible? Can he do the impossible? But many of us go through life hung in your heads. How are you, sister? Praise God, praise God. And the look of it is like, what? <laughs> oh, happy Sabbath, brother. How you doing? Why is it that many of us, it seems as if we've been eating our cereal in lemon juice every Sabbath morning. <laughs> Next slide, please. Can I walk down here? Oh, I feel so much better. Okay. <laughs> Here's a scenario that is repeating again, but it repeats every year. 
You see, the Jewish nation, for centuries, were given everything you can ever imagine. The prophets, the scrolls, the prophecies, the sanctuary, my goodness, the Shekinah glory of God over the most holy place, the incredible ceremonies, the gory sacrificial system, all the stench of blood and all that stuff that was going on before their eyes. When the Messiah appears in their midst, not only they didn't know, they didn't care. To this day, our Jewish brothers and sisters in Israel are so affected by what is called the Talmud. We think the Jews read the Old Testament. No, they don't. We think that they read the Torah and they're stuck in the Torah. No, I wish to God that they were in the Torah because they will be in Jesus by now. The Jewish nation adheres to the most profound, to the most elaborate tradition known as the Talmud. And in the Talmud, to this day, it says there's Babylonian and the Palestinian Talmud, and I've read all of them. The Babylonian Talmud, which is the most eminent of the Talmud, that is running the whole nation of Israel today, believes that Mary actually slept with a Roman guard. And the fruit of her womb was a bastard, sorcerer, magician known as Joshua or Yahshua of Nasarim. So Jesus is called a bastard to this day by his own people in Israel. And I'm not going to say where, he is, where is Jesus now according to the Talmud. We'll leave it to another occasion. On the other hand, our Muslim brothers and sisters, they know Jesus. Jesus is mentioned in the Quran. He is one of the great prophets. He was born of the virgin. He was born miraculously. He was born of the Holy Spirit. He rose the dead. He did all these miracles. They just don't know why Jesus came. You see, many Muslims believe, and, and, and it's so interesting that they condemn the Jews for being unbelieving when it came to the incredible, miraculous birth of Jesus from the Virgin. And Muslim scholars today are like, have they known that she was still virgin when she gave birth to Jesus? Wait a minute. See what is happening? His own people missed the boat. But the other Abrahamic progeny that comes into the picture, they see a little glimpse. And so what has happened? Jesus being rejected by his own people and misunderstood by a whole host of Abrahamic progeny that is still holding on to the fact, yes, he was born of the virgin. He was born miraculously, but why, we don't know. Where do you think we come into the picture? Do you think we will ever come into the picture here? Well, I want to share with you something. Next slide. In the Quran, in the Islamic scripture, Muslims are told, in time of doubt, confusion, uncertainty, there's something that they should do. I want to read these two verses for you, and then I want to engage you. The Quran says, if you are in doubt, it is talking to the Prophet of Islam and to Muslims all over the world, for all centuries. If you are in doubt about what we have revealed to you, ask those who read the book before you. The truth has come to you from your Lord. Therefore, do not be a doubter. Nor shall you reject the signs of Allah. Allah is the Arabic word for, for God in Arabic. But notice here. If you don't, for then you shall be lost. God has told Muslims, there is a group of people who read the book that was given before your time. Ask your questions from this people. And the entire Quran describes what this book is. Torah, Psalms, and the Gospels. So I have a question for you. What book contains Torah, Psalms, and the Gospels? What book? The Quran has told Muslims in time of doubt and confusion, talk to the people who read the Bible. Are you with me so far? You don't hear that on the news. You don't hear it on CNN or Fox News or any news. You read it in their scriptures. 
You won't even listen, hear it in the mosques. You will read it in their scriptures. And I will share with you what happened in the mosque a few months ago. The Quran has told Muslims, when you don't understand, when you are in doubt, uncertainty, ask the people who read the Bible. What kind of people read the Bible, the Old and New Testament? Can I ask? Tell me, church. Christians. Are we in agreement? Notice what happens now. Put the next verse on, please. The Quran says not all Christians are the same. Among the people of the book, meaning among those who read the Bible, is a community standing in obedience, reciting the verses of God during the period of the night, prostrating in prayer. They believe in Allah, in God, and the last day. They enjoin what is right, forbid what is wrong. They hasten to good deeds. These are among the righteous. Whatever good they do, never will it be removed from them. Allah knows the righteous. I have a question for you. The Quran says Muslims should ask their questions from people who read the Bible. But not everyone who reads the Bible. The Quran says among those who read the Bible, there's a community. They stand in obedience. They bow before God, meaning they don't prostrate before idols. They talk about the end times, the last day, according to the Quran, is a day of resurrection and judgment. They still do the right thing. They stay away from the wrong. These are among the righteous. Whatever good they do, God will remember the righteous works. I have a question for you. Of all Christian denominations, who do you know that talks more about the end times? Of all Christian denominations, who do you know that insists we have to honor God by obeying his commandments? So who do you think Muslims have been told to go to in time of chaos and uncertainty? See, if we say it's us, it, dis it defeats the purpose. Muslims have to come to that conclusion themselves. This is what happened to me about five years ago in a very large mosque, next slide please, in Los Angeles. I was asked to attend a conference for Christian and Muslim leaders from all over North America. This gentleman was the person that was presiding over the whole conference. His name is Dr. Jihad Turk. His name is Jihad. He was ushering the guests and everybody coming in. It was held in the largest mosque in the West Coast. It's in Los Angeles on Western Street. As I walked into the mosque, this person, this doctor, he was greeting the folks coming in. I noticed that in the fellowship area, there were a lot of Christian dignitaries and leaders from Episcopal, Methodist, Catholic Church. They were all there. As, as this man shook my hand, he said, Brother, what church do you represent? I said, I'm a minister of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. As soon as I say Seventh-day Adventist Church, he started squeezing my hand. He pulled me out of the line. You know, a whole lot of things were going through my mind at this moment, you know. <laughs> he, he held my hand really tight. He came to my ear. There's so, so many people in that mosque, you know. He came to my ear and he said, you don't know me. I don't know you. I'm Dr. Jihad Turk. I will be presiding over this conference. I'm the Islamic scholar for Claremont University, and I'm also the director of Islamic Affairs for Southern California. But I've read the Bible cover to cover. I have not come across a single statement that says Christians should honor Sunday. I have seen hundreds of statements of Sabbath, Seventh Day, the Lord's Day, and it's only you guys that do what the Bible says. He kind of turned around and he said, what's up with these guys? <laughs> Don't you all read the same book? In a mosque, you get a confirmation that you're the only people that do what the book says. Amen. So I have a question for you. Are you the people that the Quran has talked about? 14 centuries ago, before there was an Adventist movement. Do you fit the description? Many of you would rather bear torture than to say yes. You know why? Because it's coming from a completely different source. 
That completely different source has told 1.7 billion. The answer to your questions is with this group that does this, that does this, that does this. When Muslims don't hear from us, they're now going to the papacy in droves, signing allegiance, signing agreements, al-Ahzar, the largest of all Muslim jurisprudence representing one billion Muslims, they now go to the Vatican to get the answers to their questions. We cannot sit on the sidelines. Were the nation of Jews, were Israel given the precious truths of God so that when the time of the Messiah's birth would come, that they would bear witness to it? They didn't. Next slide, please. This is what is happening now before our eyes. Just a few months ago, Al-Ahzar and Vatican to set up liaison, to set up agreement. Does that bother the church? Does that bother you guys? Yes. One person said yes. yes. Two persons said two. You see why? Many of us Adventists were busy being Adventists. By being Adventist among other Adventists, God did not raise this movement to make the same mistake as ancient Israel. We are not here to hoard it to ourselves. We are here as ministers, every one of you as ministers, to share this greatest news with the world around you that you might not find popular. But they're going to the papacy. If you think radical Islam is bad now, wait till it has the auspices, wait till it has the approval of Rome. The same people who were used by God to protect us through the Protestant Reformation, because they're not hearing the three angels' message, they're making a very, very deadly mistake in reaching out to the papacy. Next slide, please. Christmas, just very briefly, means the sacrifice of Christ. It comes from the old Middle Age Latin, Misa. Christos Misa means the sacrifice of Christ. Sacrifice of Christ is what is celebrated in December 25. I was speaking to a, a new visitor to one of my congregation, Bible study group. He said, Pastor, this is great to know that this is Christ's sacrifice. Christmas actually means Christ's sacrifice, but I prefer to call it his birthday. You see why I say Christmas doesn't end? Because we have taken an incredible event, the sacrifice of Christ, and we've made it a ritual out of it. We've made it a tradition. The sacrifice and the merits of the sacrifice of Christ don't end with December 25. So you can throw it out in December 26. Next time if somebody wishes you Merry Christmas, just say, I am glad too. What do you mean? Because the word Merry means happy, being glad. And Christos Misa means the sacrifice of Christ. I'm glad that Christ was sacrificed for me. At least... There will be a body of people that will prevent secularism to butcher the incredible truth behind this event. And so we can just limit it to one ritual, one tradition, come year, come go, come year, come go, and, and we'll go through the motions and sing and all this stuff. Don't let that happen in this church. God raised this movement to finish the work of the Great Commission. I don't hear anybody say amen to that. Do you know why we don't say amen to that? Because we have settled to be comfortable Adventists. We have settled to be another denomination among myriad of denominations around the world. Every time I go back to an Islamic country, when I come back, I get, uh, I get depressed. Let's put it this way. You have oceans of people that are still not reached by the message of Christ. 
And how dare we come to church and say, Jesus is coming again, coming again. Anytime, anytime he's coming. I'm sorry, when the church is not doing the same thing that ancient Israel was supposed to do, guess what happened? God brought the least expected candidates to bring some sense of sobriety to his church. When angels appeared, my goodness, the Bible says host of angels appeared as they were talking to the shepherds. Did his people care? No. Why? Because two years later, the magis walk into the place. See, the magis, in my opinion, next to Jesus' birth, are the most mysterious thing. If you know a little bit about magis, you would say, what? Does God deal with sorcerers, astrologers, soothsayers, magicians? Yes, he does when his people are not responding to his loving nudges. But the whole issue is he didn't want his people to miss out. By the way, next time they say, oh, you greet someone Merry Christmas and they respond you back with, oh, happy holidays. No problem. Just say it. It comes from the old English, halig daig, which means holy day. Why is it holy? There is opportunity for you to explain why is it holy. Next slide, please. A little brief. The Magi's were called wise men, rightly so. You see, in the Greek language, it says magos. That's where we get the word magic from, and that's where magicians come from. It's a no-no with God's economy. We all know that. But it turns out that they were more aware of what God was doing in the skies over Israel rather than his own people who had the law, who had the sanctuary, who had the Sabbath. <clears throat> Who had the health law? Am I talking to anyone in this church? Yet when the greatest event was taking place, God entering the human sphere, they were asleep. Angels didn't wake them up. So he brought the least expected party, the kind of people Israel wanted to have nothing to do with. Yet they had information. We have seen a star. What? We're the one without all that information. Yeah, you are, but you don't read it. Where did they get this star idea from? I studied astronomy. No star moves. No star moves. These people were no dummies. We have modern astronomy. We have modern science, modern math because of Babylonians and the Persians. They knew a star when they saw one. This star is moving. We need to know why. And they traveled a thousand miles to find out this star had something to do with the birth of a king. And not just a king, but the king of kings. And we will come in drones. See, with this three, you know, little thing, you know, we have the manger with shepherds and Three guys with funny looking hats, we call them Magi's. That is so far from the truth. Magi's did not travel in threes, but from what I know, studying the Persian history and the Babylonians and the Elamites, basically they traveled in four to five hundred and sometimes two thousand. They were a sight to behold. They had their army, they had their foot soldiers, they had their espionage, they had, I mean, it was an incredible sight. Most scholars believe that the Magi's at this time, Jesus' birth, they're from Parthia, which is part of northern Persia. They, put, they would put up kings and they would take down kings. This is why Herod the Great, correction, Herod the Lunatic the Great, who had killed his own children, and he will not hesitate in killing anyone, behaves like a schoolboy when these Magi's walk into the palace. Where's the king? Knowing Herod, he would have said, I am the king. What do you mean, what king? Get these guys, behead them. And all. No, he's behaving like a schoolboy. I don't know. Could you find out? Give me a couple of days. He goes and consults with the scribes. He comes back, asks them for private. 
Here's the information that I have. Okay, we'll find him. Would you find him? Would you please come back and let me know also so I can come and worship him with a dagger in my pocket? And we all know the story. This incredible order of people walk into God's economy that had absolutely no right to be there. This is what happens when God's people don't respond to his loving visitations. He will bring the people you least expect to bring some sense of reality to us. However, they went back. But in my humble opinion, they only took a handful of this with them. Nation of Israel, by and large, rejected him. And so through the centuries, God has waited and waited patiently for his people to tell both his own people and to all this massive ocean of people what this was all about. But to this day, his own people reject him. The Magi's, which brought the information to the East, which later on was passed down to Muslims, have a small window of understanding. Our Jewish brothers and sisters reject him by and large. And we still celebrate Christmas, give gifts back and forth and back and forth every year, every year. We love to receive gifts. God loves to give us gifts. He loves the idea to give and give. After all, just think of it. He gives us a gift that he comes and walks with us, becomes one of us, enters into us, lives in us, and he can do incredible things through us. Wouldn't you think that, was, that would be the greatest gift that you ever received? Wouldn't that be a privilege to share that gift with someone? Rather than get offended, oh, they don't say Merry Christmas. We have to say Merry Christmas. Most Christians don't even know what Merry Christmas is all about. But what we have to understand, the fact is, this season, whether it's in the correct historic setting or not, doesn't matter. This season should bring a sense of the second advent to the Adventist body. Does anybody relate to that? That means you have to step out of your comfort zone. That means you have to step out of your routine. That means you have to embrace what this incredible eternal God can do through you. So let me ask you a question. Giving us this incredible gift. Do you think God loves to receive gifts? I'm not talking about tithes and offerings. Do you think he loves receiving gifts? Next slide. I want to finish with this slide. Here's a Muslim scholar, poet, that many in the West know him as Rumi. Notice what he said. Give yourself completely to God. If you don't, you are wasting your time on this earth. How many of you feel you need to give yourself completely to God? <laughs> I'll ask the question. I'm from the Middle East. We're, we're, we're persistent. We don't give up. We don't give up. How many of you on this Sabbath day, on this last Sabbath day, of 2019 want to give this gift to the Almighty okay keep your hand up keep your hand up don't keep it up for me or for anybody keep it up for yourself when you have your hand up in God's house that means you mean business do you mean business are you serious come what may Ah, come what may. Can we not, you can put your hands up, can we not make the same mistake of ancient Israel? We have Abraham as our, you know, we have this, we have the truth, we have the health laws, we have this. What do you, so did they. So did they. 
But what I want to share with us today, it is not how Christmas can be, it's why it became. Why did God choose to do this so that ultimately we can offer ourselves to him? I want to finish with one story that happened to me a few months ago. Go two slides forward. One more. How many of you remember a very horrific shooting that took, took place in Christchurch, New Zealand back in March, March 15? How many of you read or heard about it? Okay, many of you. That was on a Friday morning. One of my colleagues from Michigan, she texted me and she said, I think this would be a very, oppor very good opportunity, very appropriate time to visit a local mosque to extend our, our sympathies, our condolences with the community. So there's a very sizable mosque close to my house where I live. I drove to the parking lot of the, of the mosque. There was no place to park. There was a police car with, you know, police patrol there trying to guard the mosque for another incident. So I parked distance. I walked to the mosque. I walked to the yard of the mosque. I had never been to this mosque. One of the, one of the ushers, uh, he shook my hand and, and I said, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, and I'm here to extend sympathies and condolences on behalf of my church. The man, at first, he was a little bit not sure. He doesn't know what's under my jacket. But a smile came on his face, and he, he embraced me, and he says, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, come in, come in, brother. Walk into the mosque. I want the imam, meaning the pastor of the mosque, when he comes, I want him to meet with you. I said, great. So I walked into the mosque. All the men, you know, on the floor, very quiet, very quiet, very somber. Everybody's walking in, you know, doing their personal prayers. The women were in the next hall, watching only the, the hearing only the speaker in, in their hall, in the women's quarter. A few minutes later, the, the imam walked in. He walked right to me, shook my hand. Young man in his late 30s, early 40s, shook my hand and he said, he introduced ourselves to each other, and the first thing that comes out of his mouth said, Brother, would you bring a message from the Lord to our congregation? Yes. Yes, I will. I didn't go there to preach. I, I have nothing prepared, you know. I said, yes, I will. He says, I'll introduce you a few minutes. You come up to the podium. And so I sat in the back row as the men were coming and filled. That whole mosque was filled. A few minutes later, he introduced me, so I walked up to the microphone, of course, praying very earnestly to the mic. I came to the mic, and I started sharing with the two passages that I shared with you today from the Quran. I said, the noble Quran has told you, my brothers, that in times like this, chaos, confusion, uncertainty, you need to talk to the people who read the book that was given before the time of Quran, the Bible. I said, I am here representing this community. It's called the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We honor God. We don't worship idols. We don't eat forbidden food. We don't drink forbidden drink. And we honor God by obeying Him. The Quran has told you that among those who read the Bible, there is a community with this description. I mentioned Seventh-day Adventists maybe 10 times in my conversation, about 15 minutes. It was so fascinating that right in the middle of the crowd was sitting the, the manager of the gas station close to my house. He's a Muslim from Sri Lanka. He's looking at me. So he couldn't believe that I'm quoting from the Quran. He says, I know you're a minister. I had no idea you teach Quran. I said, I'm glad that I had an opportunity to, to talk to your brothers. At the end of the talk, I said, our master, Esau Masih alayhi salam, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he has told us, by this they will know you're my disciples, if you love one another. I'm here to say, 
we love you. My church loves you. And if there's anything we can do for you, we are available. After the service, as I walked back to the mosque, as soon as the church, as soon as the service was over, one of the head elders that was sitting on the front row, there's about three rows of elders. Big guy came up, he embraced me, he hugged me, and he said, thank you for teaching us from our own book things we did not know. It's in the beginning of the book. <laughs> things we did not know. Right then dawned on me. Muslims and Christians suffer from the same syndrome. <laughs> they don't read their scriptures. They watch too much TV. They bury their faces in their phones. And that's all there it is. Another elder came. He was the head elder. He came and he shook my hand and he said, Can I be honest with you? What is Seventh-day Adventism? You kept repeating Seventh-day Adventism. What is it? I said, Seventh-day reminds us that we are created by the hand of the Almighty in the image of the Almighty. And the seventh day of the week, Saturday, reminds us of that incredible work of creation. And that when our master, Esau Masih, Jesus Christ, came to this earth, brought us the real meaning of this incredible event in spirit and in truth. And we call Adventists because we are preparing to receive Jesus Christ and his second return. And we want to prepare as many people as we can to receive him, to meet him on that day. And I gently put my finger on his chest. I said, including you, my brother. He said, that's what Seventh-day Adventist means? I said, that's what it means. He hugs me and he comes to my ear and he says, you come preach for us again, okay? You come preach for us. They need to hear. They need to know that there is uniqueness of this movement. There was a uniqueness of God's house in Israel, but that uniqueness faded when they were unattentive to what God was doing. And so God brought the least expected party to at least awaken his own people. He did not want his people to miss out. You know, this is the beauty of it. The Magi saw the star and everything, but they did not have the entire truth. They did not know where else to go. It was God's people who had to give him the rest of the image, the rest of the story. Together, they found the Messiah. Are we availing ourselves to that huge sector of the world that knows a little bits and pieces about Jesus, but hasn't seen the clear picture? And since they haven't seen the clear picture, they're resorting, they're going, they're attending, they're reaching out to the party that has absolutely no care for Jesus' return or for salvation of souls. Can we afford sitting on our hands? One Muslim lady had watched one of our television shows. She says, are there more people like you guys? I said, yeah, there's about 20 million. What? I said, 20 million. Where? In my mind, in my mind, I said, hiding in their churches. Hiding in their churches. Let 2020 be the year that God will do the incredible through every one of us. Amen. There is a sense of mission that each and every one of us should grasp for ourselves. Don't come to church to be entertained. Don't come to church to fulfill a ritual. Don't come to church, just go through the motion. Come to church, come to church to receive your mandate from the Almighty. And when you leave, don't leave the same way you came in. Don't come to be entertained, come to contribute. Every time Israel went to the temple, every time they took their sacrifices to the temple, you know what they did? They took a meat piece of that meat back with them to, the, to their house. Why? To remind them that they were in the house of God. Take something with you when you leave this house. Don't go through the room. Don't settle for seconds. Don't settle just for, okay, we've done it this way. We'll do it again. Christmas come next week. No, Christmas is God sacrificing his best and it never ends until every single soul has heard at least once in their lifetime of this incredible work of God. Amen. He has raised this movement to finish this work. He has raised this movement because he started the last phase of his ministry in a sanctuary that many Adventists don't even care about anymore. If we believe we are the people called 
by the description of our names. Advent. The second return. Then allow God to do a revolution in you. Allow God to do that incredible work in you in this new year. You can be from all walks of life. You might not have education enough. You might not have status enough. You might not have this and that enough. God doesn't care. He gave his son for you and me. Because it's not going to be you doing the work. It will be him in you reaching out. Amen. You receive this message. Then be serious in your commitment. Let this year be the year like no other year that you avail yourselves to the Almighty to do the incredible work. Thank you for allowing me to minister. Thank you for, for the opportunity to come from different angles. I try to be very uh, cautious, conscious of time, even though I'm not, I have to, be, I have to admit. <laughs> At the beginning of the service, uh, our deacons came through the pews handing you these little envelopes. If, if you believe in the mission that we're engaged with, if you believe that Muslims have to be reached by the gospel, and just look at it. They didn't know me from Adam, and I go there to, to extend condolences. I end up preaching in this mosque. And they receive the message. So if, they, if God has given us the authority, even in a book that many Christians consider the book of Satan, even in that book that has given authority, let's live up to this authority. We're not here to survive. We're here to thrive. We're not here just to make it by. We are here representing the victor, the conqueror, who spared not even his son. May the Lord bless you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In Arabic, may the peace of God, may the blessings of God, and may all the mercies of God be upon you and upon this house. Happy New Year. Amen. Those of you who had your hands up, turn them up again. I want to pray for you. Father, we praise you. We thank you. We rejoice in you. And we will marvel at you for ceaseless ages of eternity. How can an infinite God, how can an eternal perfect God, a holy God, choose to dwell in contaminated vessels like us? That is the best news I have ever heard. And so, Father, let this best news turn your church on fire. Turn us individually on fire. That we may remember, if God gave his son for me, he gave him for others. That heaven without my cousin, without my parents, without my sister, without my husband, wife, will not be heaven for me. And so, Father, I don't want them to miss out. At least give me the zeal, the conviction to share while I can still share. May this year your church thrive. May this church, your church, go on conquering and conquer. Will it be easy? No way. Will it be pleasant? Maybe, maybe not. Will it be popular, not with the agents of darkness? But what you have started in us, take it to completion in this coming year. In Jesus' name we all said, Amen. Amen. Amen.